centuries later, the Suez Canal was eventually built. Dariush is, of course, also the king who helped build the great city of Persepolis. The ruins of that once great city are still considered one of the most important historic sites in the world. Its architecture, combining eclectic influences from many corners of the globe, exemplifies the genius of the Persian spirit. Persians freely adopted aspects of other cultures, but always did so only after creatively, creatively transforming them into something that was uniquely Persian. This fascinating trajectory can be traced in everything from the way we prepare our tea and our rice, which you've had some tonight, to the way we build our colonnades and our domes. Even in religion, the same spirit seems to have prevailed. In a monumental four-volume study, the French philosopher Henri Corbin has shown in some detail how pre-Islamic Zoroastrian, Mithraic, and Manichaean ideas, by dint of the Persian assimilating genius, were reformulated in such a way as to make them at once amenable to the conquering Arabs and their new religion. Indeed, an eclectic cultural elasticity has been said to be one of the key defining characteristics of the Persian spirit. The bulk of my time has already lapsed, and I have barely hit even the high notes of the first 500 years of Persian history. I have hardly finished the overture to the symphony I had promised. If we had more time, I would have talked about the library at Saruye, located near where Esfahan is today. Though only a few random pages of its vast holdings have survived, we know of its grandeur through the testimony of its contemporaries, who compared it in terms of its, the awe it inspired to the Egyptian pyramids. We could have reminisced about the famous Jundi Shapur Medical Center in pre-Islamic Iran. I could have offered evidence of its refreshing openness to scholars and physicians from any and all religions and nationalities of the world. We could have delighted in discovering the fascinating role Persia played in the consciousness of the medieval Western mind. We could have talked of the Grail legend and the scholarly belief that its sources should be sought in the Persian myth of the Cup of Jamshid and in the text Borzunami. We would have talked of the role Persians played in the early inception of A Thousand and One Night, often called one of the most influential books of all time. The Shahzad of the story, a Persian princess, is universally re recognized as the archetypal storyteller, the embodiment of the power of clever and cunning narrative. <clears throat> we could have talked of the impressive litany of Persian theologians, philosophers, mathematicians, astronomers, and scientists who, according to Ehsan Yar Shater, helped shape what has come to be called the golden age of Islam. I would have reminded you that as an ironic result of the Crusades, Europeans rediscovered Aristotle through the Islamic world, and that this discovery in turn helped create the Renaissance. I would have told you about Abyssinia and Biruni, whose work in medicine and astronomy were standard text in European universities well into the 19th century. We would have talked about the work of scholars who argued that the Copernican revolution in Europe could not have been possible without the earlier contributions of Western astron Iranian astronomers. I would have reminded you of the glories of the Rasat Khane Maraghe, the observatory of Maraghe, arguably the most famous center for astronomical research in the 13th century. At that time, we have evidence that scholars from as far away as Sweden